My name is Yu Han Yao. I'm a fifth year graduate student at Caltech. I'll be talking about two science cases that access will contribute to in areas of time domain science. Uh, I'll first focus on tidal disruption events and switch to luminous fast blue optical transients for the second half. So as you may know, the majority of massive black holes in the center of galaxies are quiescent, but they can be awakened when the star comes too close to it to get disrupted. We have the tidal force where the star's self-gravity equals to the, or the tidal radius where the star's self-gravity equals to the tidal force. And if RT is outside of the black hole's event horizon, the disrupted star will evolve into an elongated stream, half of which will come back to get accreted, producing a multi wavelength flare. And this sets the uh, black hole mass of the majority of TDEs to be less than 10 to the eight solar masses. And if the black hole mass is less than a few times 10 to the seven, then the expected stellar debris mass fallback rate exceeds the Eddington limit at early time. Uh, in reality, the mass equation rate onto the black hole might be lower than that of the mass fallback rate because the fraction of the falling back material may self interact, producing shocks where energy dissipates. But still, we can reasonably imagine scenarios where a uh, mildly super adjacent disk forms. And by studying X rays from the newly formed accretion disk, we can start to reveal what this super adjacent accretion onto massive black holes look like. The importance of super adjacent accretion has been emphasized by the detection of AGNs at less than one giga year after the Big Bang which implies that if those black holes had grown from low mass seeds, then super Eddington accretion must have occurred. However, the physics of super Eddington accretion is highly uncertain. For example, um, fast outflows are often produced in numerical simulations, but uh, observationally, they are not very well characterized. Nor do we understand the conditions under which relativistic jets are launched. And such outflows and jets regulate the growth of the host galaxies via the feedback mechanisms and shape the cosmic black hole galaxy coevolution. So far, we know of four TDEs associated with uh, on axis relativistic jets. Here I'm showing the X ray light curves of three of them. Um, Swift J1644 and J2058 were discovered by Swift Bet more than a decade ago. And uh, AT 2022 CMC was discovered more recently by the Zwicky Transient Optical Facility. One of the most exciting properties about those relativistic TDEs is that roughly at rest from one year after the discovery, the X-ray flux can suddenly drop by more than two orders of magnitude. And this drastic change in luminosity has been explained as a state transition in the inner accretion disk. So here, as the mass accretion rate drops from super Eddington to sub Eddington, the disk can transition from being geometrically thick to geometrically thin and enters into a thermally dominated state. And such a thin disk lacks the ability to confine magnetic fields, so it's no longer expected to be able to hold powerful jets. With access, we want to verify if such a late-time jet shutoff exists in all relativistic TDEs. And more importantly, we also want to measure the post-jet quenching X-ray spectra shape, which encodes information about the origin of the X-ray emission. If the X-ray spectrum is very soft, the X-rays may originate from thermal emission in a geometrically thin disk. If it is very hard, the X-rays may be produced by inverse Compton scattering of thermal seed photons in a corona region. And if the power law index is close to two, then the X-rays may come from the uh, high energy extension of the same forward shock synchrotron emission that we observe at radio frequencies. This type of measurement has only been done in the case of Swift J1644. People have obtained more than 100 kiloseconds of Chandra time to get 10 to 20 X-ray photons. And the observed X-ray uh, spectra shape is consistent 
with a relatively hard power law. However, J1644 is the uh, most nearby relativistic TDE. Because the volumetric rate of such event is so small, all other known relativistic TDEs are at much further distances. And if we assume that their post-jet shutoff X-ray luminosity is similar to that of J1644, then the expected X-ray flux is only a few times 10 to the minus 16. So science at such a faint X-ray regime can hardly be done even with Chandra. And that's why access is so important to study the relativistic jet quenching phenomena in TDEs. And uh, in addition to its excellent sensitivity, the energy resolution and the timing precision of access will also allow it to explore the spectral timing properties of relativistic TDEs. For example, in SWIFT J1644, early time XM Newton observations shows an emission line peaking at 8 keV, consistent with blue shifted RNK alpha line. And this uh, has been naturally explained as the fluorescence of the jet X-rays of an ionized uh, reflector. Such a reflector might be an outflowing wind moving from the disk towards us, which might be accelerated by the jet X-rays impinging on the surrounding envelope of the shocked stellar debris. It has also been observed that the uh, variations in the iron emission line follow that of the continuum emission by a time lag of 120 seconds. And this is also consistent with the jet envelope interaction picture. So future multi-epoch axis observations on other relativistic TDEs will help to uh, confirm or falsify the ubiquitous existence of such a line emission and the associated reverberation lag. While well, events like J1644 exhibit hard X-ray spectrum, the vast majority of TDEs that X-ray and optical sky surveys discover are not associated with relativistic jets. They remain extremely soft throughout the evolution for a few years. We call them non-relativistic TDEs or normal TDEs. Among them, Assassin 14LI is one of the most well-studied object. So here, this figure shows the uh, X-ray, UV, and optical evolution of the TDE. And in this work, Kara et al. focused on the continuum shape of the XM Newton spectrum. Here, the early time data obtained roughly one month after discovery is shown in pink, and the late time data is shown in blue. Uh, you can see a broad absorption line that's only discernible at early time which is consistent with an oxygen-8 absorption line blue shifted by 0.2c. And this blue shift has been attributed to an ultra-fast outflow driven by the high radiation pressure in the super Eddington equation disk. So far, Assassin 14LI is still the only normal TDE with a high confidence UFO detection. Because to search for UFOs in TDEs, um, all the existing X-ray facilities have their constraints. Uh, the effective area of Chandra is just not large enough. XM Newton has its visibility windows, and uh, Chandra as a concentrator has um, background uncertainties at the soft X-ray energies. The design of Axis will make it the ideal instrument to search for the presence of UFOs, and such that we can use the UFO velocities and absorption strengths to model the energetics and structures of the super Eddington equation inflow and outflow. And the last TDE science case I want to highlight is the potential opportunity to determine spin in an otherwise quiescent black hole. So the traditional approach to determine spin in accretion, uh, in accretion black holes is to observe the reflection spectrum in the hard state. Here, the reflection spectrum is produced by the continuum uh, power law corona emission reflected off the accretion disk. If the black hole is maximally spinning, then the innermost stable circular orbit is closer to the black hole 
And in that case, the iron fluorescence line will be smeared redward, showing a broader red wing. So by obtaining X-ray spectra of AGNs, people have constrained spin in roughly three dozen black holes with masses from 10 to the six to 10 to the 10 solar masses. You can see that these measurements suggest that AGNs are uh, pretty rapidly spinning. And up until recently, we have thought that such an approach can hardly be applied to TVEs because many of the normal TVEs remain soft and never enter into the hard state. But surprisingly, in the recent TDE AT2021 EHB, joint observations between NICER and New Star clearly shows that at later time during the TDE evolution, the X-ray spectrum develops a prominent hard power law component, as well as an extremely broad line around 6 keV, which is presumably from iron K-alpha emission. So in the future, we would like to find more TDEs with evidence of late time corona formation and use access to constrain the spin of the otherwise quiescent black hole. Hopefully we will be able to find uh, sources hosted by 10 to the five solar mass black holes. And it would be very interesting to see if black holes towards such uh, intermediate mass regimes still exhibit high spins. So in summary, we want to use axes to observe TDEs to understand super identical accretion and constrain black hole spins. And now I want to switch to luminous fast blue optical transients, which are explosive phenomena with much smaller central engines. Uh, we believe the central engines uh, uh, either actively accreting stellar mass black holes or highly spinning neutron stars. So by definition, the term fast blue optical transients or F-bots describes extra galactic transients with a total duration about half maximum that's less than 12 days. So compared with uh, normal TDEs and uh, normal supernovae, they evolve much faster. And thanks to modern industrialized high cadence time domain surveys such as CTF and ATLAS, in recent years, we have obtained a sample of F-bots with the early time optical spectrum. Almost all of them occur in star forming galaxies, indicating that their progenitors are probably related to massive star explosions. Spectroscopically, there are three subclasses. The first two subclasses are actually not physically distinct from normal massive star explosions. They rise to peak faster because they are embedded in some dense circumstellar medium. And the interaction between the outgoing ejecta and the CSM adds extra luminosity to their early time light curves. The third subclass, which we call luminous F-bots, is actually a little mysterious. They have the shortest duration above half maximum and the highest peak luminosities. And surprisingly, all of them are accompanied by very luminous X-ray and radio emission. So in the millimeter and radio bands, we observe synchrotron emission generated by electrons accelerated in a shock wave. If we put luminous F-bots in the canonical radio diagram between peak luminosity and peak time times peak frequency, then we can see that those luminous F-bots are much brighter than normal supernovae, which implies that the shock wave driven from luminous F-bots might be more collimated and more energetic than the spherical wind case in normal quark-up supernovae. And moreover, the inferred shock velocity is only mildly relativistic. So the physical picture of luminous F-bots is also different from that of long GRBs, which have relativistic jets. Among the five known luminous F-bots, AT2018 Cal is the best studied event. Uh, in the X-ray, it's more than a thousand times brighter than normal quark cups events. Um, and the, such a high luminosity requires a central engine as the uh, powering source. In addition, the fast X-ray variability seen by Swift XRT also points to a small emitting region. In terms of the X-ray spectrum, 
uh, you can see features reminiscent of relativistic reflection only at early time which implies that uh, there must be some equatorial material at early time to reflect off the continuum X-ray emission. And recently, the NICER X-ray telescope also reported the detection of a high-frequency QPO, which further supports the existence of a central compact object. So this emerging class of engine-driven stellar explosions has become the frontier of studies of massive star deaths. And the major open question is the nature of the central engine. And for this problem, X-ray is the most important wavelength because it probes materials that's closest to the central powering source. The light curve decay rate provides an essential diagnostic. Suppose the energy deposition has some characteristic energy and time scale. Then for an actively accreting magnetar, the uh, decay slope will be very steep. And for fallback onto black holes, the decay power law index is close to 5 thirds. And this decay will be even shallower in some viscously accreting disk scenarios. In reality, the early time high energy emission might be reprocessed or absorbed by the outflowing wind or ejecta. So we need to combine the X-ray measurements with the UV optical emission, uh, information. In the case of AT2018 Cal, the overall bolometric light curve decay rate is about two, which is somewhat in between the um, magnetar and black hole predictions. But for all other luminous F-bots, we actually do not have a good characterization of their X-ray light curves. You can see that 16, uh, CSS 161010 has a late time detection at 10 to the 40 ergs per second, but it don't have any early time data. Uh, AT2020 XND was much further away, so only Chandra was able to see it. And based on three data points, we think its overall evolution might be similar to that of 18 cal. Uh, there is another event which was not observed in the X-ray. And finally, I want to highlight AT2020 MRF, which was actually realized to be an interesting X-ray transient by the Erosita telescope. And the uh, Chandra observations at one year after discovery shows that there is strong variability even at such a late time. So continued follow-up with Chandra and even with access at late time will um, continue to constrain the characteristic time scale and energetics of the central engine. The volumetric rate of luminous f is very small. So to construct a sample of events with good X-ray coverage, we want to make sure that every year at least one luminous F-bot can be followed up in the X-ray down to a meaningful limit of 10 to the 40 ergs per second. And uh, as you can see, this requires an X-ray instrument with a sensitivity that's seven times 10 to the minus 16 CGS unit, which uh, speaks for the requirement of a sensitive X-ray facility. And it's not all about the sensitivity. The excellent angular resolution that AXIS provides at the level of one arc second will become increasingly important for uh, extra galactic time domain science. For example, in the case of AT2020 MRF, Chandra observation really helped to see which of the sources within the Erosita localization region is the host galaxy of the X-ray transient. And uh, going back to tidal disruption events, although we expect most massive black holes to be in the center of the galaxies, simulations do predict the existence of a population of wandering black holes, which might be produced by uh, disruption of satellite galaxies or ejections due to gravitational, gravitational recoil use. So far, we only know one uh, convincing of nuclear tidal disruption event. It was discovered by searches in the XM Newton archive. Here is the HST image, and you can see that the X-ray transient is in coincidence with a tiny optical counterpart, which is probably a star cluster around an intermediate mass black hole. The volumetric rate of such of nuclear TDEs is perhaps much smaller, which explains why we haven't found more of such events. But with next generation time domain surveys, 
we are probing the dynamic universe out to a much larger volume, such that we have better chance to characterize those intrinsically rare events. Here I'm listing uh, few sky surveys across the electromagnetic spectrum. This is by no means a complete list, but I do want to highlight that uh, UVAX in the ultraviolet and LSST in the optical will be able to find uh, a thousand TDEs every year. The actual num number of luminous f -bots will be very uncertain because this um, strongly depends on the actual, actual cadence those surveys adopt. So currently we have the Zwicky transient facility in the optical and Ultraset will be launched next year. They will be able to find transients down to 10 to the minus 13 ergs per centimeter square per second. But with LSST and UVAX, we can really probe in the bottom end of the luminosity functions of each of the transient populations. And for those transient, we want the X-ray follow-up sensitivity to at least match the discovery engines such that we can take advantages of those new deep sky surveys to constrain rates, to characterize the long-term evolution, and to review peculiar transients. So with that, I thank you for your listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. OK, great. Um, so actually, we have a couple in the chat, so maybe we'll start with those. Um, so Daiichi Hiramatsu, sorry if I mispronounced, uh, asked, what sets the limits of 1e e to the fifth um, in terms of the black hole mass that can be probed in TDEs? That's requiring that the stellar radius to be to uh, to be less than the event horizon of the black hole. Otherwise, the black hole will enter into the, the star. So that sets the lower limit. But the 10 to the 5 number is based on a solar type star. So for even less massive stars uh, like M type dwarfs, the lower limit will be even smaller. Yeah, this the coating number from 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 8 is for a sun like star. Okay. Um, and then Winho asked if um, about the QP, QPO and AT 2018 Cal, if it's spin, if it has a spin period, then it cannot be a magnetar. Yeah, I, I guess Wayne is much more familiar with the um, QPO in, in the Cal because he's the second author of the, the paper. Um, yeah, I, I guess if we believe it's a spin period, then um, the black hole scenario might be more, um, more possible. <laughs> But I don't think this is, um, we have a solid answer for what's the nature of the central engine. So so uh, one question from me, and then if there's other questions, um, please just uh, raise your hand in the chat. Um, so what type of, you know, so we'll trigger for the X-ray satellite, we would trigger off the, you know, optical or UV detection. And what type of response times do you need in terms of, you know, hours? I mean, I, I kind of know what SWIFT is um, in terms of a few hours, but, but what, you know, do you get a huge benefit if you go less than two hours or? I think for the two science cases that's um, highlighted here, our <laughs> response is probably not very necessary, but day, day time scale response would be required because as you can see, the um, in the case of 18 call, Swift get to the source two to three days after the discovery. And the early time data is definitely very different from the late time evolution. Um, I, I think um, for relativistic TDEs, the, we would benefit from uh, our time scale response because in the case of SWIFT J1644, the early time X-ray actually uh, has very dramatic reliability, which people interpret to be precession objects. Um, so with our time scale response, we will be able to catch that. Um, but that also requires a discovery to be even earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, are there any other questions from the audience? Yeah, just uh, for the QPOs, what's the frequency? How fast do we need to time? What time resolution do we need? Yeah, so um, for luminous fast blue optical transients, the QPO is 200 hertz. So um, timing precision will, I think we will need that be millisecond precision. Um, but for, I think for, for tidal disruption events, it is maybe harder because the black hole mass is, um, let me see. <laughs> the, the requirement for precision is not as hard, but we need the GTI to be longer to be able to detect the a long QPO in TDEs. Um, okay. Oh, go, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. If, if you want to put more, more in the chat as well, um, Johan, that, that was a really good talk. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, so we're, so we're going to switch over now. Um,